Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a uh, classic, cult classic movie actor, and I am talking about John Philbin. John Philbin, of course, played Chuck in that classic, The Return of the Living Dead, celebrating its 35th anniversary this year. He was also in Children of the Corn, The New Kids, Grandview USA, a couple surf classics, North Shore, Point Break, the classic Western Tombstone, so many great movies. And I'm having him on the show today to talk about all that stuff. He's also a surfing expert, obviously, because he's been in those movies and stuff. And we are going to talk um, about all that stuff. And I can't wait. So yeah, here is my interview with John Philbin. Hey, John. Hey, Tom. Uh, welcome Welcome to to Tommy or Tom. Uh, Either one that don't matter to me. (laughs) Yeah, just as long as you don't call me Thomas. (laughs) Good, let's do that. Absolutely. Welcome to the show. This is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Pleasure to be on the show. Thank you, sir. So, going back in time, uh, was acting or surfing your passion early on, or both? Uh, I love that question. Both. <laughs> I was. Uh, I grew up surfing, and I loved it. And mm-hmm. I also started acting in school, doing little school plays. And when I was in high school, I did have to choose between acting and, like, organized sports, wrestling. I was on the wrestling team, and at some point nice. the coach in front of everybody goes, you got to decide whether you're going to do the drama play or wrestle with the team. And I was like, I'm going to go do the plays. So I chose theater, acting over organized wrestling sports when I was in high school. There's a funny story. Mm-hmm. I, I was in the – can I tell you a funny story? I, Absolutely. But I've never – I've never – but. But just for the record, I love both of them, and surfing has brought me into a lot of roles in acting that I never would have gotten if I hadn't been a surfer. Yeah. I, I, I love acting, and I dream of acting, but I'm, I surf all the time. It's easy to go surfing for yourself. It's harder to get an acting job in a film. Mm-hmm. But surfing has brought me some jobs in films that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise, and I'm really grateful for that. But anyway, I'm in high school. I'm going into my junior year, and I'm coming back from a surf trip, and I've got three wrestlers in the back of the seat. My dad's driving, and the two of the wrestlers, their dad is in the front mm. seat. And we're coming back, and one of the great wrestlers on our team, Ed Toss, Palisade High School Wrestling, he goes, aren't you excited, John? We're going to wrestling practice starts next week. Aren't you stoked to get back to it? And I'm like, I'm not going to wrestle this year. <laughs> I'm really quiet in the car. It's like, what? Why not? I said, I'm going to do the drama plays instead. And then it got really, you could just feel the tension <laughs> in the car of all these dudes and my dad and yeah. my no dad of the wrestlers. And he was like, why? I said, well, you know that feeling when you're wrestling and you pin your opponent and that's as good as you can do, you know, and the match is over and you've won and, and it's a pin and mm-hmm. your, your adrenaline's just surging and you've done the best you could do. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I love that feeling. And I go, yeah. Well, when I'm on stage, I get the, I get the same exact feeling every time I walk on stage in, in a play. And then I could see people kind of relax. My dad kind of relaxed. And he, he was like, I felt like I explained that pretty well. But I'll <laughs> never forget that. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, I wrestled when I was in high school, too. Yeah, it's a tough sport. It's a great sport. I loved it. I was little, so I could, you know, I did pretty good. And I was a surfer, so I had some upper body strength. But I, I, you know, it's so much more fun to do to do plays with girls, and it, it's just such a lifestyle choice. And I just wasn't hardcore like like those other guys. Yeah. Well, for for surfing though, what age did you start? I was probably eleven, you know, eleven or twelve years old when I started surfing. You know, mm-hmm. ride that down to the beach, and then as I got better, I could walk down to the cliff where I grew up and surf the reefs in Palos Verdes. It was magic. It was super magic. I just fell in love with it. Yeah. Did you uh, listen to Jan Dean growing up? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, going to a Beach Boys concert was such a big deal. It was like, and they're singing about us. 
I love all those surf, surf bands. I still do. I still love surf music. I love psychedelic surf music, you know, like the cramp. It's just, mm-hmm. it's cool. It's a great culture. Yeah. I just interviewed Dean a couple of weeks ago. Oh my God. That's cool. Yeah. He's a great guy. I was really honored. So, yeah. So after high school, um, did you study acting with anybody prominent in L.A. to uh, pursue acting? That's a great question. Well, first, I, after high school, I graduated in 78. I went to UC Santa Barbara for a year and a half, and I was an econ major because I, you know, I didn't think acting was the real thing. And then I was like, fuck, I did a play at UC Santa Barbara, and I went, this is the thing. I'm not going to be an econ major. I'm just, I just want to be an actor. So I transferred to USC, to the conservatory in USC, because I figured if I was going to be an actor, I was going to have to move to L.A. and live, you know, in the city and check out Hollywood. So I was a pretty sheltered suburban kid, surfer. And so I, I transferred. I went to USC Conservatory of Fine Arts, and, and I went for three years. I graduated there. I got a BFA. I did a ton of theater, took a bunch of classes, met people that were real actors, you know, Mm-hmm. started exploring the city, found that I actually loved living in Los Angeles. I loved L.A. as the city and living in a city. When I graduated USC, I did a couple of plays, and I started, you know, I got Children of the Corner, I think it was the first movie, Children of the Corner, Grand USA, and I got mm-hmm. these acting jobs, these movies, and I was like, fuck, oh, this is cool. And I, I met, I talked to a friend of mine who was also a professional actor, and he was in this class with Peggy Fury. Oh, yeah. He said, you should come in and audition, and so or meet her, and I did an interview, and she let me in her class, and I started studying acting with Peggy Fury, and I studied acting with Peggy Fury until she passed away. Probably six years, you know, I was in the class, and that was as good as it gets for a young actor. I mean, that class was just magic, and so many great people studied with her, and she was such a great teacher, had a great time. Was Corinne in your class? I don't know. Corinne who? Corinne Boyer. Uh, She was in a lot of movies back in the 80s. Yeah. She was. Corinne Boyer was in my class. I mean, you know, Sean Penn, Nick Cage, Meg Ryan. Yeah. We were all studying with Peggy. Eric Stoltz. Dean Eric Stoltz, Trump, yeah. Megan West, Nicole Panther. We all were in the same class doing plays. And it was fucking amazing, you know, working with, you know, working with those people. And just seeing them going like, God, Sean, Sean Penn's here. He's in the class. I mean, you know, he's watching the class. It was just gnarly and great. And we had, it was just a dream come true for young actors just it was so artistic, you know, it gave us a, 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 we really had something going there. We really felt great. I mean, it's not professional. I mean, we're paying to be in the, for the privilege of studying with Peggy Fury, but it was really educational and it was a wonderful dream come true time of my life. Yeah. That's our too. You know, after she passed away, I, I mm. studied for a while. I did a couple, a couple movies and I, I found, um, I found this. Oh no, I had a, I'm having a, a senior moment. <laughs> I am having a senior moment. Larry, I want to say Larry Moss. Yeah, Larry, yeah. I, I, I studied with Larry Moss for a couple of years, and that was also equally, not equally, different, but intense. He was amazing. When he was out here in L.A., Larry mm-hmm. Moss had these acting classes, and I was into them. They were very psychological and very advanced and emotional and really great. I really, really, really got a lot out of him, too. Nice, nice. So how, how did um, Children of the Corn come to you? Was that just an, an audition you went out on? Yeah, I mean, I had done a couple plays in L.A. when I got out, equity waiver plays, right when I graduated USC. I was lucky enough to get into a couple plays. And yeah, one of them, you know, managers thought, said, hey, man, do you have an agent? or do you go? I go, no, I don't. I just got a college. I just got a theater and doing plays. And he said, well, let me pick you up and introduce you to some people. And he introduced me to a great agent named Steve Donsonville, and Steve hooked me up with an audition for Grandview USA for Randall Kleiser. I think I auditioned with Cher, actually, for, <laughs> uh, to play this character Cowboy, and I got the job. It was the first movie I ever I ever got. I did a couple of, a bunch of lame auditions I can't remember that I didn't get, but I, the first movie I got was Grandview USA. And it's a great movie. It was, yeah, and but the first movie I did while I was waiting to go because that movie wasn't shooting quite yet, I I also auditioned for and got the Children of the Corn, where I only had to work for like two weeks in Iowa, and then I was just straight to Grandview, the Grandview USA set. And so I my first movie I worked on, professional movie, was Children of the Corn, right. and I had um, Jeff Greenberg was one of those 
casting directors, and I, I got to play Amos in that, and that was the very first time I'd ever shot film. And then I, I, it was great practice before going to shoot for MV USA. Yeah, I talked to uh, Fritz Kirsch uh, last year. He's a character. Uh, what was yeah, he? What was he like as a director? Oh, he was awesome. I, was, I didn't know what was going on. First time I'd ever been in a feature film, so I was just, "What do you want me to do? Like, am I doing the right? Have everything going? I'm just doing my thing, you know." He didn't have anything, you know. I had a great time. I loved Fritz Kirsch. It was my first, you know. I just looked up to him. You know, he's my first director. Yeah, he was a very nice guy. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, uh, and then you did the uh, new kids. How was that experience? Fucking awesome. We, we flew out to, you know, I auditioned in LA, and then we flew. Sean Cunningham flew us out, a bunch of actors out to Florida to audition with other actors, you know, and kind of like a boot camp. And he lived in Florida. He was going to shoot in Florida, and I, I felt like I did as good as I could possibly do on that audition. I was young and super enthusiastic and we flew back to LA. I don't think this shit happens anymore. My, yeah, I'm sure it does on the bigger level. Back then it was like, yeah, you got the job, you know, it's 10 weeks and you're staying in a hotel with all the actors. Like you'd get there for the beginning of the movie and all the way through to the end. And it was, you know, Jimmy Spader, Eric Stoltz. It was amazing. Lori Loughlin. Yep. And, uh, you know, it was so cool to meet Jimmy Spader and to work with Eric Stoltz and Jimmy and, and all the other people and Lori who was uh, and Sean Cunningham was gnarly director and it was fucking awesome. I loved it. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see that movie again actually. I wonder where you can get a copy of that. That'd be a fun movie. I'd like to see that again. Yeah, I think it's only on VHS. I don't think it's ever been released on DVD. Bummer. Yeah, I know. It's a great movie. It should be released on Blu-ray now. Yeah. And uh, what's his name? Shannon Presby. He quit acting and became a prosecutor, I heard. Yeah, he's, he's, I'm sure he's an amazing lawyer. You know, he's just super smart, you know, real man, manly man kind of a guy. He's probably a good move. Yeah. Were you shocked um, at what happened to Lori Laughlin? Because I, I went to USC. I'm a Trojan. Uh, I was shocked. Yeah, I was shocked by that whole scandal. I'm like, USC? I mean, there, there's... I mean, I didn't know that that school was that hard to get into. It wasn't when I was going to college, you know, it was easy to get into those schools. It was like, I couldn't believe that it was ranked up there with the schools that people would break the law and have to go to jail for trying to get their kids into. That shocked me. But times have changed, and I'm out of touch with that. I don't have to, I'm not concerned in the whole where your kids go to school thing. So yeah. it's just entertainment for me. I feel bad for her. I think her, her husband was a fraternity brother of mine, Massimo, and I, I know they just want the best for their kids, and they just got caught up in this scandal of, which parents was just fucking, it was uh, shocking. Yeah, I was shocked. Yeah, it was just, it. I, I just never thought, I, I never thought that she would be, you know, anyone involved in a scandal like that ever, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when it comes to kids, though, you just can't cross that bridge. If parents with their kids have a special relationship and nobody knows, if you, you know, I think people would do anything for their children, whatever they think would be best for their kids, but willing to go to jail for them and break the law, whatever, if it'll help. And I can't judge her or anything. I cannot judge her because I don't have kids that I have to protect and worry about and try to steer in the right direction. I, I'm sure I'd probably do anything for my kids if I could. I don't know, but I, I can't tell you what I would do because I don't have kids. Yeah, it reminded me of uh, what what John Mahoney did in that movie. Say anything, you know. He basically uh, stole. Um, he basically embezzled, you know, so his daughter could go to college, and he ended up in jail at the end of the movie. It, it reminded me of that kind of a situation. That's a good reference. Good, good pull. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know if anyone else uh, figured that out, but I'm glad I did. Yeah, Tommy killed it with that. You nailed that reference. Thank you. <laughs> So, uh, the timeless classic, The Return of the Living Dead, uh, was that a, an audition situation too? Oh yeah, we all auditioned for Dan O'Bannon in groups, and he would just whip, narrow it down until he found the chemistry for the different parts that he was looking for, and he had a definite idea in mind, and he would just, we'd audition day after day after day in groups until he found the chemistry he was looking for, the different types of people and characters. And then, you know, gave us the go-ahead. It was right during an actor strike, so we were all very thrilled to be working, you know, w with Dan O'Bannon and, and at that time, because it was uh, definitely, the unions were going on 
back and we got in just just in time. Mm-hmm. Nice. Now there's this there's this um, mythic aura about the movie, and I've talked to some people. Some people say. You know, it was a bad experience, and people say it was a good experience. But for the record, what was your take on the experience? Well, I like that you said it was. There's a mythic aura around the film. That that is a movie that just keeps on giving. I was just online talking about a convention, a horror movie convention reunion, we're set to do with the zombies. You know, at Monrovia in the mall in Pennsylvania in November. So yeah, our, we are a family now. When we made the movie, I had nothing but good good things to say about it. I never had a bad experience. I thought it was <clears throat> gnarly because we were always wet and always scared and always together. And, you know, there was shit going on. Like, you know, it was a low budget movie, but Dan, he, was very, he knew exactly what he wanted. And so he was in control and he had a, Herculean effort trying to bring uh, an original vision to the screen, whereas most of us didn't know what that vision was and, and what we were doing. So I think he, he had us in a good place so he could mold us and get us to do what he wanted us to do. I loved it. I got, I you know, I did it and I let, and I went home. I didn't know if it was going to come out. I didn't know what mm-hmm. it would be like. I was shocked when I saw that movie. I was blown away. I did not expect it to have that kind of punch and that, you know, it became a cult movie because it's got this tone that was unique and original at the time and I was just over, I was just couldn't believe how interesting and different it was and, and yeah. the music was so good. So I did it, the movie came out and, you know, I thought about it moving on, making other movies working or, or not, sometimes not working, just living life. And then it was years afterwards that they started screening at the Egyptian Theater in Hollywood, and there would be big sell out with people lined up around the block. It became this thing that no one could have ever anticipated. And I am very glad and very lucky to have been a part of that. I'm a very small little part of something that is still alive today, probably more popular today than it's ever been. Mm-hmm. And I'm just lucky that I got to be a part of it. I had a great time doing it, and now all those people are my family. Back then, I never talked to the, you know, people again until we started doing these reunion tours. Now they're, we, we travel around as like a little family and get together, and, and it's fun. I love everyone that had anything to do with that movie. Yeah, I mean... And all the fans of it. Love them. I've met all these wonderful people from all over the world, mm-hmm. and that. That doesn't happen very often in film. I'm just glad that I, you know, I have a little part in this movie, and I now I get to go around and meet people from all over, and that's really fun for anyone. But I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, I mean, your, your exchanges with Jewel are great in the movie. You know, she tells you to go choke a chicken. <laughs> I know she's fucking awesome. Renee and Jewel and Deb, they're just priceless characters. I love them all. I'm, I just, I just such fans of all those people that had anything to do with that movie. I loved seeing them. Yeah, Jewel and I had some radical scenes together. It was so much fun. I loved it. I loved Carman. I loved everything about it. I had so much fun. James Cameron, R.I.P., I loved him. It was just great to, to, to get to know them. And I didn't get to know them until after the, you know, until 10 years after we made that movie. So it became, you know, what it is now, a cult classic. It was awesome. Mm-hmm. Tom's a great guy. I've, I've talked to him. And when oh, they... good. I'm, yeah, he's great, guys. I actually did know Tom before we did the movie, and, and he, he he was a friend of mine and a friend of a friend. So he's the only guy I know. That, you know, I knew before, and I will know forever. But I'm glad I got to be in that movie with him. I didn't have any scenes with him, but it was super cool to it's super cool to see him on these conventions. He's such a cool guy. He's smooth, man. Tommy Tiger. Tiger's his nickname, man. He is one hell of a dude. Yeah. <laughs> what was Mark Venturini like? It was so sweet, just so nice, and just wanted to be around him. He had a charisma about him. He was funny and kind, very kind and generous and just cool and funny and mellow, you know. Mm -hmm. And, boy, what an impact he made on screen, man. That guy could have been a movie star. He was so powerful in his scenes and that thing. He He really could have been a movie star. Yeah, I didn't even know he was dead till just recently, and I was like, "How come he never does conventions?" And then I found out what happened. So, exactly. Right. That would have been a good question to post online. How come 
Tom, Tom, make sure you never does conventions. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't do that, though. <laughs> but uh, I, I've seen the documentary, and there's a story in there. I was, I was wondering if you could confirm. Uh, Clue uh, allegedly threw something at Dan O'Banion. Yeah, I mean, it might have happened. I wasn't there. I didn't see it. I've heard there's different stories about the stuff that went on. I was not privy to those. I wasn't on the set. Mm -hmm. Only on the set for the scenes I shot. So when I saw that movie, I was like, what the fuck is going on? But, uh, you know, uh, I've heard there's all kinds of wonderful drama stories that you get when you go to the convention and people ask, you know, the people that have something to do with it. And Mm -hmm. who's still around and he's still alive. He is fucking awesome to ask questions. He's the guy to ask that question, too. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think I can get him though. But um, I did see him in that new Tarantino movie just for like five seconds. He was yeah, he, yeah. He was like a bookstore clerk. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he. I can't believe he he's in that movie. I mean, what a fucking career span, man. He gets to be in that movie with Margot Robbie. They shot a lot, you know, and they only used a little bit. But they went back and looked at it and decided to use a little bit more in a different in a director's cut. So I want to. I can't. I want to see that too. Yeah, I interviewed James Drury about two weeks before he passed, and I said, uh, what was it like working with Clue Gulliger on the Virginian? And I got, like, a no comment from him. <laughs> so I thought it was pretty so weird. Funny. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah. You did a um, very memorable episode of Amazing Stories. Yeah, very memorable to me, for sure. That was a big deal. Um, yes, I did. I mean... You want to hear a story from that episode? Of course. All right. I will tell you. So we're all pretty excited to be working with Steven Spielberg. Kevin Costner's not a movie star yet. He has been in American Flyer, and I knew he was going to be a movie star. He might have also been in that Larry Cass and Cowboy scene. Yeah. Of movie. And I was like, that guy is fucking special, you know. But now we're doing, of course, he's the lead in a Steven Spielberg, you know, show, and he's playing a hero, and he's, he's our captain, and he's fucking super cool to us, and he's like, Super young and, and and you know enthusiastic and but very serious actor, very good actor. And so there's a scene in that mo- in that episode where he is in the captain's thing and he has to perform kind of a magic trick, like where he has to think about something, hesitate, push a button, and pull a thing, and that's when the you know wheels come down. And that just saved the life of the guy, Casey Zemesco, who's trapped in the bullet turret underneath the plane. is going to get squished when we come into land because we can't get our wheels down. So all the other actors are off the airplane. This is Kevin's close-up. Even got a floating camera on a crane with a hero light, little tiny light, you know, for your irises. If you can find that light, your eyes will light up. Kevin's green if he finds that light. And it's floating around, and it's going to come in tight on Kevin Costner's face when he thinks about pulling that lever and then pulls that lever. Steven's got all of us actors are crowded around the monitor, which is at the bottom of this, this, this you know huge hangar. And we're looking up at the cockpit of the plane and the camera, and Steven's behind the monitor, and all us actors, Keeper Sutherland, we're all hanging out behind Steven Spielberg, looking at the screen and looking up at Kevin who's in, up in the cockpit all by himself, you know, in this huge studio. Right. Steven goes, okay, Kevin, this is, uh, this is the most important part, you know, of the film. I really need you to do something special here. The camera's going to float. It's going to come in. I want you to take a moment, think about it, do something special here. Mm-hmm. Okay? Ready? Action. And we're all just like, Jesus Christ pressure what are you supposed to do with that and we're looking at the monitor and the wind's blowing and there's fog and people are bumping the plane and the floating camera's coming up and you see kevin's face getting bigger and bigger and bigger mm-hmm. and you see him take a moment and you see his eyes he finds the little tiny pen light that's underneath the camera his, his eyes just light up green he thinks about something for a moment he pushes a button and he look and he looks up and steven goes cut and he turns to all these young actors behind him and goes, that guy's going to be a movie star. Mark my words. He just did for me exactly what Harrison Ford did for me in Raiders of the Lost Ark. That guy's going to be a movie star. And he walks away. And we're all wow. like, we just got fucking history being made. I mean, that's insane. And we all go up to Kevin afterwards going, Kevin, even just said you're going to be a movie star, bro. And he's like, I, he did? I am? Oh, that's great. That's cool. He was super humble and cool and excited. But that's, that's when he got you know, definitive word from the definitive man that he was going to be a movie star for the rest of his life. 
Wow, who knew, huh? <laughs> pretty cool. Pretty cool. It's a pretty cool moment to witness. That is pretty cool, yeah. I also see uh, Karen Copens was in that episode. I'm trying to get her. She's on Instagram, and I found her. And hopefully, I'll get to interview her. Uh, I interviewed J.J. Cohen last year. What was he like to work with? Awesome. What a cool dude, man. He's up in the cockpit with, with, you know, with Kevin Costner. He's just, he's just, he's just dead, man. That was awesome. He was, he, was a, he was a little bit of a handful to interview, but uh, he's a good guy. Yeah, for sure. What does that mean, a handful to interview? Like, how do, what does that mean? He, okay, so he was, like, spinning me around in, like, different directions. And I probably asked him at least five questions the entire interview. I didn't get to ask him a lot of stuff that I had written down. I mean, he was just taking me in all these different directions. It was just it's one of those th- ones you have to like listen to in order to understand. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. I don't know what was up with him. Yeah. But, but uh, you finally got to uh, make your first surfing movie with North Shore. Oh, you are just going down the lid. You have got my, my what's that called? My, what's that called? IMDB. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, North Shore. That's right. Then I got to do North Shore. What a fucking dream come true that was for me anyway. I'm a surfer. My agent sends me a script to play a character who surfs pipeline. And I am like, that, that is, I need, I was born, I need this part. I was born to play this part, but they, the director, did not see it. And the studio at Universal Studios, they were looking at me going, this guy doesn't even look like a surfer. You know, because they're about image, you know, and I'm like, what do you mean I don't look like a surfer? I'm, it's like, they're like, he's not even blonde. I mean, but uh, producer, Randall Kleiser, was the director of, of uh, Grandview USA. So he knew that I was kind of a method actor at the time, and he had faith that I would become that character if I was given a chance. And I auditioned seven times. I kept saying, I go, you, you've got to give me another chance. I, I can do this, but I couldn't show them what I could do, you know, mm-hmm. I had I was working on something. I've had to have blonde hair and get my chest waxed and learn how to speak in a dialect. I had to create this character, and luckily for me, they did give me the chance. And as soon as I got there, I met the character, the man that that character is based on, and I just went, "You're the guy I'm playing." He's like, "Yeah." Mm-hmm. I'm like, "You're moving in with me, bro." And I just went to school on him. He trained me to play him in that movie to you know to play that character. I never could have done that without him. His name's Brian King, and it was fucking a dream come true for me. It was definitely my most informed performance. Even though it's a surf movie, I was I love surfing, so mm-hmm. I brought to that all my love and respect for that sport and that lifestyle. And that guy totally helped me. And I love Matt Adler. I just went surfing with him at Point Doom. I just got back from surfing with Rick Kane, the lead in that movie. I met him wow. on that movie, and we are friends this day still surfing. That doesn't happen very often. That was 30 years ago. And that movie went on to become a cult movie in the surf world, as much as, a, as, much as the surf world can have cult movies. But there's, it's got, you know, it's got a couple, and I was in all of them. And I'm just so lucky for that. Because I'm not that great of a surfer, but surfing just means so much to me. Mm-hmm. I'm able to be a bunch of surf movies. But that started the whole thing, and I'll, that's the gift that keeps on giving, and I love it. Yeah. That's probably Work. Yeah, you do you do a great performance in that. You know, I used to watch it all the time. It used to be on HBO a lot back in the day, and I used to watch it all the time and stuff. Uh, I especially like Gregory Harrison in it. Yeah, fuck, what is that guy? So cool. Yeah, and then um, you got to do another surf movie with Point Break. I know. <laughs> yeah, Point Break. I mean, what? What can I say? What, did you have any questions about Point Break? Yeah, I mean, was 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 that was that just as fun as North Shore? I was totally different mm-hmm. because I was playing a character who was very angry and very gnarly, and he didn't have a lot of scenes, you know, where he, you know, I had to find find a way to define him, which is like my back, my gun, you know, like a couple of sentences. You know, it was, um, but the movie was a powerful experience. 
experience working with Patrick and Keanu and my gang, James McGro and Bo Jesse Christopher, and, you know, Patrick Swayze and Lee Turgeson, mm-hmm. we, you know, we had such a bonding experience on that film with Patrick and skydiving and stuff and surfing that, but it was, it was gnarly. You know, I was, an, you know, I had, I was angry and, and gnarly and I was kind of the heavy in that movie and that, that's different from being a sweet, nice guy that's got a lot of scenes and goes through emotional things like in North Shore and is a local at a spot. And it's just a different, such a different experience. And Catherine Bigelow is such a, such a serious director and a good, you know, there's no, there was no, there was no fucking around. I mean, we were so hardcore in that movie and it was, it was amazing. Yeah. I mean, it was amazing, but that was a big production, a lot of money, you know. Yeah. Serious. Work so it was as good as it gets, but just yeah, I don't think it, it can get better than that. But I was definitely, I that character, I, I, you know, you're kind of trapped in a character, you can't like be having fun all the time when you're playing a gnarly guy. So it wasn't as fun as North Shore. I worked on North Shore, I'm like, I'm, I'm only working two, three days a week, and I'm training by surfing pipeline and studying Hawaiian, you know, pigeon language and the local you know, what it's like to be a local on the North Shore, like a, but on, during Point Break, I'm studying skydiving and guns and robbing banks and like, beating people up and stuff. It was heavy. Yeah. Did you see the remake? I did. I, I did see the remake. Yeah. Did you think it was good? No. Yeah. I thought it was the worst movie I've ever seen. I have never seen a worse movie. They made, bad movies like that, that's right. as bad as it gets. I was sickened by that piece of shit. I cannot believe they let people, they give money to the fucking people that don't know how to make movies. That was just, that was an insult. That was gross. What a fucking bomb. That movie was in and out of the theater in a week and just people had nothing but horrible things to say about it. But, on the good side, it does employ stunt surfers. I think a lot of good you know, stunt surfers got to work, and it's good for them, you know, but I'm an actor, so when I see a movie like that, I'm, like, disgusted. Yeah, I have it, and I won't see it, so... It's just piece of shit. It's, those people just don't know how to make movies, but that's all right, you know, that's life, you know, they got a lot of money, so they bought, you know, the title, and then they threw a lot of money at it. It's it just, they just don't... It's not... It's sad that it's got the same name as Point Break, and they just... It's, it's such a piece of shit movie. <laughs> they, you know, yeah. people make bad movies, and that's one of them. Yeah, I mean, especially in remake history, you know, so many remakes are terrible. It's been going on forever, you know, like yeah. the 1976 King Kong, and John Gillerman was a good director, but that just wasn't, I don't know, just it, it wasn't that great, you know, even though that um, technology had advanced by the 70s, you know, since the first one was made in the 30s, it just, I, I don't think it was that great. You know, I love uh, the boost. Do you have a story about that movie? Uh, yeah, I love. That's so funny. Nobody. I mean, I love the boost. Too. I love James Woods. I love Sean. So, Carol Becker is the director. I get this little small part to play a surfer in the boost. I go, mm-hmm. okay, I gotta write this script because I happen to be sober. And in this scene, this surfer who's smoking a joint is talking to James Woods about why he doesn't drink. And I came up with all this dialogue. And I thought, when I get to the set, we'll, we'll rehearse the dialogue, and they'll use my dialogue. But that is not how the movie business goes, unless you're a star. And they're like, no, just stick to the dialogue. And I swear, I'd almost forgotten the original dialogue. <laughs> so this whole time, I'm like mm. thinking about all this stuff, I, this cool stuff I came up with. Based on being sober and what it means to not drink or do drugs, cocaine. And I was, I was going to ask him, it, and at one point I'm sitting in the stand, the camera's rolling, and I can just hear the threads of the film going through the camera, just going, I, have, I don't have a thought in my mind. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? What am I supposed to say to this guy right now? And then I just said it. I was just like a stone surfer. It kind of worked out fine for the scene, and I'm glad you liked it. But yeah, that's, that's I had been a cocaine addict and I was like an alcoholic and I was like so excited to be a part of that movie and then so <laughs> put in my place and disillusioned of my 
position in the film when, when I, he was like, no, no, just do, just do these lines that we wrote. Don't, don't, don't add lip. Don't add anything. Mm-hmm. It taught me a little less. Well, were, were you involved with that stuff still when you were making it? Oh, hell no. I was sober. You know, I, I was oh. not, I was clean and sober for all the movies I, I, did, I ever did. There was just time before the movie, before I became a professional actor, where I was like just out of control. And there was another time after I stopped working as an actor when I was just depressed and like, you know, didn't have anything to do. And I just also relapsed into, you know, drugs and alcohol until it just took me down. And then I started up again. Now I'm sober again. And I got to be in a couple movies now that I'm sober. I've, I've got like three movies that you can see right now that I, I'm really proud of. So. Yeah, I can't work and do drugs at the same time. Yeah, because it's like walking and chewing gum at the same time. <laughs> it's just one or the other, you know. I'm an all-in guy, so I love being sober, and I am right now, and I was then too, and it's the only way for me. Yeah, I've been sober five years now, and I had a boy. It's, yeah, Tommy. It's been a miracle. Yes. Well, I had a car accident, and that set me straight. So I'm really proud of myself on that. Do you uh, do you have a uh, tombstone story? <laughs> I think that that's yeah. I mean, I was also there from the from the reading of the script, the table read, to the last day of filming out in Arizona, in Tucson, Arizona, with that cast. And without a doubt, the coolest thing that happened that whole time that I was involved in was when we rehearsed the shooting at the OK Corral, the shootout at the OK Corral. Mm-hmm. We were trying to be authentic. We were timed it. We blocked it. We rehearsed it, and they said, "Okay, we're going to shoot one. We're just going to time it and shoot just a rehearsal action." And not not because it was really really just a rehearsal. I don't think it was actually. I don't think we actually shot this. So some people might have had little cameras out. From action to cut, we went back and looked at the record, and we had shot the exact amount of rounds in the exact amount of time that the history book that we were going off of was which what, what we were using to recreate the shoot at the OK Corral. And everybody kind of felt it because we'd been rehearsing it, rearing a horse, shotgun blast, you know, people getting shot, you know. We had, we had really re- rehearsed it a lot. And when we did that first all run through, we hit it by the shell and by the second. And we all felt kind of like special. At that moment, we felt like we were involved in something kind of magical, and we kind of were pretty excited about it. I, I, I know I was. That was really heavy and really, really amazing movie to be a part of, and I'm so glad it did well and became, you know, respected in the Western world. Yeah, and I, th- I think most actors and most directors want to make a Western. Oh, yeah. Like, just part of American cinema history, you know, not even, even a, just a cinema history, you know, westerns are, I don't think they make them so much anymore, but I'm just so glad I got to be a part of it. Yeah, so it was a real dream job for you. It really was, because I love riding horses and shooting guns, and we're just out in the desert, and, you know, I'm also kind of a glorified extra in a way, like, I've, I'm in a lot of scenes, but I don't have a lot of dialogue in a lot of scenes, so I spend a lot of time just talking, hanging out with the greatest actors in the world riding horses and shooting guns and it was really fun i love that kind of shit <laughs> <laughs> did you get to interact at all with val kilmer no nobody did i mean <laughs> you weren't kurt russell you didn't get to interact with val kilmer i mean kurt and val were having a love affair that movie was was about their love affair and they they had to kind of get together and help change the script and help the director mold that film because you know the original writer director had been replaced by an action director who didn't oh, understand. Yeah. And, you know he, he tried to he didn't even know horses ate or, you know didn't eat meat i mean <laughs> like get that horse and put a chest down here throw some meat throw some hamburger down for the horse to eat yeah <laughs> like, well, horses don't eat uh, hamburgers but um but he you know he made it a fast moving action film and that what it needed to happen. Kevin Jarry, such a brilliant writer, and he was going to direct it in the very kind of stage stick. You know, it would have taken, it would have been a five hour movie. So we, you know, they replaced, they sent us all home. They were, cut the script. They cut 25% out of the script. They brought us all back. 
get another read through, a new director, and a whole new situation on you know down in Arizona. We just made this movie, you know, the best we could. Bill Paxton, Sam Elliott, Kurt Russell, Val Kilmer. It was it was a, he- a lot of heavy hitters. Stephen Lang, a lot of actors in that movie, and the women were amazing too. And uh, you know. When, when it came, when they put it together and came out, people liked it. And I'm just another one. I'm really lucky to have been a real small part of. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned before um, you have a, f- a few uh, new movies uh, out that are available. Were you? Um, did you have anything lined up before quarantine started that you were going to work on? <laughs> no, I didn't. The quarantine hasn't changed my life that much. I live alone. I surf. I ride my motorcycle. You know, I. And what it changed was. I teach surfing now, professionally, you know, nice. for, for money. Like that's been what I do to pick up, you know, spare change. And uh, it's been good to me. And I had a couple trips planned, you know, with clients, but those all got canceled. So I'm just kind of with, in the same boat everyone else is, you know, staying at home, not working. I, I am going to teach this weekend, and they did open LA County Beach, excuse me, beaches, so I can go back to work. I can get clients, but I didn't have. Lined up to shoot, no. But I do have three movies, no. I have two movies that are available to view right now, and a third that has not come out, finished post production yet. And the best of those movies is well, there's this short film, White Wolves, that I play a pretty integral part in. Mm-hmm. The short, great woman's film, but I enjoy doing it. And then the one I'm most proud of is I'm the lead in is Undateable John, which is available on <laughs> Amazon Prime. And that with Tom Arnold and Daryl Hannah and Stella Warren. And it is Joan it Jett. Is I, I, I see the cast here on IMDb. Joan Jett, Meredith Baxter, Russell Simmons. That's a huge cast. <laughs> yeah, and I'm the, I, I, it, it is so, I love that movie, Undateable John. It just came out. It didn't just come out, it out for a while. It's on Amazon Prime. It's super cheap. It's super fun. I, I'm really proud of it. Yeah, I got Amazon. I'll check it out. Wow, that's cool. Do you ever uh, do the conventions? What conventions? The horror conventions? Yes, I do them with, uh, I go with the cast of Return of the Living Dead. Mm -hmm. We've been to, we've been all over the United States. I haven't been to London or Germany yet, but we've been to New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, you know, Texas. We've been all over the United States, you know, at horror conventions. Canada, we've been up to Canada. We, you know, we're we're going to go to Pennsylvania in November if it's healthy for everybody. Because some of these people, some of these people are older. But yeah, I go to these conventions every year. I do a couple conventions. We get to get with the cast and they show the movie. We do a Q and A and we sign autographs. And it has been a wonderful little side sidebar thing, and I I love it. I love the conventions. Yeah, I've done like Comic Con. I've you know. Driven down there in a limo, and walk through this insane mass of people, and sit up. Okay, ready to go. The line comes through. You're signing. You've only got 45 minutes or something. Then you're done. The line stops, and you get back in the car. And it's fucking rad. I love conventions. I think they're so much fun. I wish I'd do more of them. Yeah, I've met almost everybody um, individually uh, from the movie and stuff. Um, but uh, hopefully, one day I'll see you at a convention. Yeah, well, the next one I'm doing is Monrovia. It's in November in Pennsylvania. I, I, ju- I just I heard that they rescheduled it, yeah. Yeah, that's it. No, that's, yeah, that's it. And we're just hoping that, that we all feel safe and maybe there's a vaccine or some kind of prophylactic thing. We'll see. Who knows what's <laughs> going to happen with this virus. You know, I wouldn't go into a situation like that now, that's for sure. Yeah, no. <laughs> Hopefully everything will turn out just right. But yeah. um, I want to thank you so much for coming on today, John. This has been a great talk. Oh, it's my pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure, sir. And uh, you have yourself a great day. Stay safe and catch yeah. those waves. <laughs> okay, great. Hey, let me know when it comes out. I want to listen to it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Have a great day. Have a great night. You too. Bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. John Philbin. Ain't he a cool dude? Nice guy. Great guy. Like him a lot. Um, If you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. 
join my Tommy Kovac comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, There's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes. It's party time.